On the 23rd of June 2016, 51.9% of people in the UK voted to leave the European Union in an advisory referendum. Ever since, Britain has been bitterly divided over Brexit. Bye bye then. We are leaving. See you later. Bye. Get used to it. Have a good holiday. I'm not leaving. In December 2018, a team of activists went around the UK on a big yellow bollocks to Brexit bus, taking their pro European message around the UK and beyond. Dr. Mike Goldsworthy, academic and co founder of campaign groups Scientists for EU and Healthier in the EU. Stephen Bray, founder of Stand Up Defiance European Movement, who has protested outside Parliament every day while in session since 2017. Graham Hughes, British adventurer who has travelled to every country in the world without flying in four years. Drew Galdron, professional Boris Johnson impersonator known as Faux Bojo. Madalena Kay, singer, songwriter, musician and author known as the EU Supergirl. The bus tour was organised by the campaign group EU Flag Mafia. Funding for this tour came from UK residents who wished for the UK to remain in the EU, who crowdfunded over £15,000 for the cause. No money came from the European Commission. Madalena Kay has been campaigning non-stop since 2017 to keep the UK inside the European Union through her music, her art and her speeches. Because the greatest achievement that the European Union has had in the last 40 years is the peace that it has brought to our continent. And also the peace that it has brought to Ireland. My name is Tom Jackson Wood. And in December 2018, I joined Madalena and other EU activists on the Bollocks to Brexit bus tour. In the context that we are using this word, it means nonsense. And it has been ruled in an obscenity trial not to be an obscenity in a court of law, 1970s historic uh, Sex Pistols case. So anyone that claims that we are offending them, that's their subjective opinion and therefore their own problem. This is bad for our economy, it is bad for our public services, and it is bad for our country. And that's why we have to say, bollocks to Brexit! Because the truth is, there is only one obscenity on the side of this bus. And it's that word! And we are also saying thank you to the European Union for everything that it has done for our country over the last four decades. And we need to start informing people about everything that the EU does to benefit their lives. And we need to start celebrating our European identities and our European citizenship. We have never been about overturning the will of the people. We've always been about building an escape route out for the people when our own useless government gets themselves into trouble. And that's exactly what we've done. Because we are European, we have built up community right across this country, right down to the grassroots, and we want to remain and reform and build Europe to be better for all of us right across the continent. Come over here and get the adulation. Because that's, that's hardcore physical endeavours as well as mental endeavours to be here to, since 6 this morning. That's 13 hours now, isn't it? Yes. Say something if you've still got energy left in your body. Uh, it's worth every damn second. Yeah. Yeah. Stop Brexit! Yeah. Stop Brexit! If I can quote from the first 
Brexit secretary, if those living in a democracy do not get a chance to change their minds, then that country ceases to be a democracy. Those are the words of David Davis. And one day I hope we will get him to eat them. <laughs> but the UK has the most important post-war peace treaty. And it's called the Good Friday Agreement, or the Belfast Agreement. That brought to an end 40 years of conflict and strife. Thousands of people died in Northern Ireland. People died in Britain. Kids died in Warrington, for God's sake. And this peace treaty brought an end to it. And as part of the peace treaty, it says there cannot be a border on the island of Ireland. The most important achievement of the EU in the last 45 years is the peace that it has brought to our continent, and especially to the island of Ireland. And that peace process is still incredibly fragile. The political situation in Northern Ireland is complicated. And that was why we've come to Brussels to find some people who can explain it to us. We're looking for some experts. Experts on the Irish border. No one asks for experts on the Irish border. I, yeah. I thought we'd had enough of experts, Tom. No? Uh, I, it's really... The, the reason why we came here is that there's a lot of talk about the backstop in Northern, in Northern Ireland and the Irish border. And we wanted, to, we wanted to know why it was so controversial. And we also want to find out a bit more about the peace process and why it's still needed. We're heading to the European Economic and Social Committee building in Brussels to meet Jane Morris, a politician from Northern Ireland, and Brian Maguire, a journalist and broadcaster from Belfast who is based in Brussels and covers European politics and business news through his company EBX Media. How far has Northern Ireland come since the signing of the Good Friday Agreement in 1998? I could use the term light years or leaps and bounds, but it's huge how far Northern Ireland has come since 1998. That being said, it's still got a long way to go. It's, this analogy of light is, is particularly appropriate. I think it's come from the Dark Ages into the Modern Age. And the, the, the big challenges are remain really hard you continue to advance uh, its economy which underpins the whole of the peace process. Okay, that's great, thank you. Should Brexit happen and the UK leaves the EU, how will the role of the EU change in Northern Ireland? Um, will it still be able to run in the programmes that are currently in place um, due to the input of the Republic? There has been a very important commitment on behalf of the European Union to keep the peace programmes operational in Northern Ireland and, and the interreg cross-border programme. And that's very, very important because that's a part that the European Union set it up, the most unique uh, peace programme uh, in, in the European Union's history, apart from its own creation. And um, you, it, keeping that going, that's a huge investment. That's been two billion uh, euros been put into uh, Northern Ireland to support cross border work, cross community work, and if that if that fell off the cliff edge with, with Brexit, uh, then that would be very bad for Northern Ireland, so it has to keep going. It's not just about Northern Ireland continuing to have a European presence because of the peace process, it's, it's directly linked to, to the Republic of Ireland's economy, but the peace process has been underwritten uh, to a very large part by the European uh, project, by European money. Without European money you risk the bloodshed returning because the, the sense of uh, impoverishment, the sense of uh, removal from uh, core elements of society. This increases the tension and the sense that people don't have anything left to lose. So European money guarantees, uh, to a large part, the stability of Northern Ireland uh, as, as an entity and whether that remains in the United Kingdom or within the Republic of Ireland, that will continue to be the case. The other reason we came to Brussels is because the British Prime Minister Theresa May was in town on the 13th of December 2018 trying to renegotiate her deal with the European Union. So we went there to remind her that over 48% of the British people want to remain in the EU. And Theresa May, I hope you're listening over there. Your deal is not good enough for the British people. And if Jeremy Corbyn can hear me back in the UK, it is not possible to negotiate any deal that is good enough 
enough for the British people. Because Brexit is not good enough for the British people. The best deal that we can get is the one that we currently have inside the European Union. Working in collaboration and partnership with our 27 neighbours and friends. And I think we have done the EU a huge disservice by even entertaining this Brexit idea. Of all the issues surrounding Brexit, the thorniest one has been the Irish backstop. I was keen to ask Jane Morris more about what it does and why it's been so controversial. The backstop is the compromise solution, is what I'm describing it as. The best deal is no Brexit at all, uh, but that, if it's the case that that cannot happen, uh, what is going to happen is the backstop. And it is, it's been described as the best of of all worlds, best of both worlds, it allows Northern Ireland to stay in the single market and stay in the customs union. So it's primarily about goods and services. But you know, why is it causing so much controversy? I, I do believe that um, it's uh, playing politics here because there's talk about a border down the Irish Sea and this sort of thing, but it's only for goods and you know, it's much, much more important to talk about people. And the very fact that the Good Friday Agreement gives people in Northern Ireland dual nationality, to, they can be Irish or British or both, which means they are entitled to be Europeans. And that's a hugely important issue for Northern Ireland, which isn't properly looked at. It's citizens' rights to be Europeans. So Jane, why is the peace process in Northern Ireland still needed 20 years on after the Good Friday Agreement? And how does Brexit threaten it? It's very, very important that the peace process keeps going because we're talking about the need for reconciliation. And uh, the, the communities in Northern Ireland uh, were entrenched, but Brexit has actually entrenched them even further. And the greatest threat that Brexit poses is to the Irish border in yeah. Ireland, and we can't allow that to happen. The nationalist community has a long history of identifying with other independence struggles elsewhere in the world, and many of these can be seen here on the Divis murals on Falls Road. Considering Northern Ireland voted to remain in the EU, and it's possible that Northern Ireland could get dragged out of it, it's not too surprising that, in the not too distant future, you may find some murals around here marking the EU. For the Northern Irish peace process to succeed, both sides had to renounce violence. For the nationalist community in particular, with a long history of discrimination, they had to find a way to express themselves peacefully instead of through violence. Key to this success was the Fair and Travail, the People's Festival. Established in 1988, it's become the biggest community festival in Northern Ireland and the 2018 festival featured big names such as Ollie Murs and Cara Dillon. This festival allowed the nationalist community to express themselves through creativity and art and it gives them a platform to share it with the world. The debate over whether Northern Ireland should remain part of the United Kingdom or reunite with the Republic of Ireland is still ongoing. But thanks to efforts such as the Fairley Festival, the debate is now fought with words rather than bullets and bombs. I just find this fascinating. This road used to be a complete no-go for the British Army. And listen, it's a carnival parade. That is what peace building looks like. It looks like this, and it's fun.
The identity of Ireland as a nation as well has changed substantially. It's no longer seen as a, a country beholden to the Catholic Church. Northern Protestants feel much more comfortable with that. It's seen as a modern, pragmatic European economy, so it has taken on this European identity as well. And this new generation within Northern Ireland especially, it sees itself, in part at least, as belonging to Europe as well. Since the Good Friday Agreement was signed, there has been a revival in the Irish Gaelic language. Most of these efforts had been taking place in the nationalist community, but in the last five years, there has been a growth of the Irish language in the unionist community as well. I've come here to meet Linda Irvine, who runs the Turas Initiative, which provides courses in Irish language and history for the local community here in East Belfast. I'm curious, Linda, um, can you explain to me a little bit about um, how you came to be teaching the Gaelic language in the Indian community? Well, it came about accidentally, it wasn't a plan. Um, I started learning Irish, it was actually I was introduced to the language as a, a six-week taster here in East Belfast Mission, and that was about seven years ago, it was part of a, a cross-community group. And I was just say Hitchman and Ralish and Changa, I fell in love with the language. Yeah, I think it's sad just um, because of the, the more recent history. And I mean, I'll we'll come back as far as Padraig Pierce and things. Um, you know, the, the, the people see the language, I suppose, as a Catholic language or a Republican language. So, what we're doing is we run bus tours, we run history classes, we're teaching people about the history of this area that is pre-plantation and saying you know, there was something here before this. Can you tell me a little bit how you, how you feel that the European Union has helped the Unionist community? Well I mean the Unionist community have benefited a lot from the peace money that come in and there's been different tranches of peace money. The, you know, the money from the EU, the peace money come into Northern Ireland has helped many, many projects. This one included the Scales Bill and wouldn't have came about without peace money. And I think it's really sad now how communities have forgotten how they've been with it. And I don't think that certainly everybody within the Unionist community is in favour of Brexit. They certainly don't. But I think it's sad that the DUP have fought so hard for Brexit, which will be harmful to Northern Ireland in the long run. Uh, I, I think it's just sad that people have forgotten so quickly. Around you to Nards Road and other unionist areas of Belfast, the words quis separabit often show up. It underlines the union of Northern Ireland with, with mainland Britain, and in Latin this means who will divide us? Well, Brexit might. While many unionists like the idea of a harder border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland in the south, some of them realise the damage this will do to Northern Ireland's economy and it will leave everyone worse off. If goods can't cross the border by land, instead all goods will have to come by sea and air. And Northern Ireland's ports aren't ready to handle the increased traffic should the UK leave the EU. Currently, Belfast Harbour alone handles 67% of Northern Ireland's seaborne trade but the new customs infrastructure that will be needed isn't in place. Of all the EU27 member states, Ireland will be the most affected by Brexit. As such, it was important for us to bring the bus to Dublin, as we wanted to show people in Ireland that we are against Brexit and we do not want this. Nor do the majority of people in Northern Ireland most people in Ireland, north or south of the border, do not want Brexit to happen. Protect, Protect connect, connect, innovate, innovate collaborate, collaborate inside the, the European, European Union. <laughs> With the Irish border being so important, I wanted to speak to someone who grew up there and could tell me more about living there firsthand. And I was really lucky to meet Connor Patrick McArdle, who works for New Europeans Ireland. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself? and what your work involves for New Europeans. Oh, my name's Connor Patrick McCarley. I am 
one of the coordinators for New Europeans Ireland here. We are a sister organization of New Europeans, which is based, based in Brussels and London. I'd always been quite uh, politically sort of aware and interested, and I really sort of seen this Brexit drama that was unfolding and how it was going to impact not just my homeland, but me, my family, everywhere in there, younger generations. I really want to try and get involved. It's tough to start something new, especially um, in such terrible political times. And New Europeans for me is, um, it's very important that I'm actively trying to do something. We're trying to promote a positive European um, message, a positive European image, and sort of really reach the grassroots of society that often feel very dis disenfranchised and detached from the sort of traditional European movements and sort of traditional European project as a whole, really. So I'm from uh, Middletown, which is a small rural village in County Armagh. It gets its name because it's halfway between Derry and Dublin, sitting in the Irish countryside, and it's pretty picturesque, it's very quiet. And thankfully that's the way it's been for maybe just over 20 years or so. But go back 30 or 40, it was a very different place. Soldiers were constantly patrolling the small, quiet country lanes. You had a massive police barracks in the centre of the town, which dominated the skyline. And you had, of course, a hard border customs post that was a constant target of IRA attacks. Only thing you would notice slightly different is that the road signs would change, the speed limit would change. So growing up at the border, there was that sense that we were quite lucky in that this scar in the landscape was finally beginning to heal. So I feel that's why Brexit is very scary and very terrifying because all it takes is a tinderbox still in that we're lucky enough here in the north of Ireland that we, we have a piece, but it's a very fragile one and it's a tinderbox and all it could take is one little spark and that spark could be Brexit on a hard border, which is frightening. Because to be honest right now, as much as I'm a European and as much as I believe in the European project, I don't want to see this country go back to the way it was. And for a lot of people, it's, people just see it as politics. But for me and for many people up and down this little corner of this island and across the whole island of Ireland, this is real life. This is something that can have major implications and it's something that we had no hand in. So, the question really is, are there any solutions to Brexit? I think we are the solution, Tom. I think the people of the United Kingdom are going to be the solution to this mess. And that's why we're driving around the country on a big bollocks to Brexit bus. Because we're trying to tell people, if you are sick of hearing about Brexit, the only way to stop hearing about it is to stop Brexit. We have still got a lot of work to do to inform people and educate them and make the positive case to remain in the European Union. How do you describe Brexit in a word? Shambles. Nonsense. Shit. Lies. Brexit is division. Wrong. Injustices. Nightmare. A fraud. Suicide. Illegal. Death. Anger. Chaos. Chaos. Shit. Catastrophe. Catastrophe. Disaster. 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 Bollocks. 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 Bollocks! Bollocks to Brexit! Bollocks to Brexit! The UK left the EU on the 31st of January 2020. Brexit won. But already a majority of people in the UK are against it. Poll after poll has shown that a majority of British people are in favour of remaining in the EU or rejoining it. The Conservative government won a majority of seats in a snap general election in December 2019 with the slogan, Get Brexit Done. But they didn't win a majority of votes. 53% of voters voted against this. The UK now has the largest grassroots pro-European movement across the whole of Europe. The campaign continues. We have learned to love, we have learned to forgive, we found a solution that everyone could live. To 
Never. Ever. 